I want to start uh, with this brief introduction by um, telling you a, a little story. A few uh, few months ago, uh, I was interviewed, and and the interviewer asked me to think about the two greatest. What, what were the two greatest discoveries in sustainability that I could remember? Well, that's a pretty tall order, and um, I thought for a minute. It really caught me cold. I thought for a minute, and, and though this isn't really a discovery, this image uh, taken in 1972 from the Apollo mission was a pretty, had a pretty profound influence on me. The, uh, the blue marble, it's not only spectacularly beautiful, but it really drove home. I mean, the first image from outer space was 1947 from NASA but, but, um, of, of Earth, but this one really drove home to me. Um, how finite the system is. We are uh, floating in, a, in, in, in basically a closed system for matter. It's, of course, an open system for energy, but as a first approximation, a closed system for matter. So it's finite. And that was kind of an epiphany for me when I was, um, I probably shouldn't admit it, but when I was a high school student um, back when this image was, was released. The second data set or discovery um, that came to my mind was this one. Alumni Charles Keeling did his master's in chemistry here at the University of Illinois, produced the Mauna Loa curve. And he began making these measurements in the, in the late 50s. Um, and this is, the, this is the trajectory of carbon dioxide uh, through time. Um, and it really, it really was the, the, the most impactful evidence that human beings could change, change the Earth system. I was just... Uh, two days ago in Manchester, England, and uh, they have the distinguishing feature of having Man U, a great football team, but also they were the uh, heart of the Industrial Revolution that set, set this trajectory uh, going. I'm not giving them sole blame, but uh, they were the heart of the trajectory um, that set this thing going. For uh, younger scientists in the room, uh, this work was funded by the National Science Foundation in 1958. And by 1963, after Keeling had articulated and published on the annual oscillation, the breathing of the planet caused by the seasonal balance of respiration and photosynthesis, NSF denied further funding, I think in 62 or 63, uh, saying that you've done what you've needed to do. We know the pattern. And so, of course, that would not have resolved this. So a shout out to persistence with funding and a shout out for long term data sets. So, of course, this increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, along with the other greenhouse gases, is, is the driver of what we, of, of what we now call climate change. Uh, climate change, uh, back when I first started studying it in the early 80s, was a thing of the future. We now know that it's here. It's upon us. The Earth system is, is warming. We heard a beautiful presentation by Holdren uh, and a very insightful presentation by Dr. John Holdren last night. Um, attesting to the fact that we are, we are living in a changed Earth system. Uh, the atmosphere is warmed up. There's more water in the atmosphere. There's more water falling out of the atmosphere. We're seeing more frequent floods. Uh, we're living that um, this summer. A little earlier in the summer, in August, I flew into Portland, and it looked like I was flying into Beijing in terms of air quality. Most of the West is on fire this summer, big chunks of fire. Fires, so the precipitation regime, those one in a thousand year floods are now happening one in 10 years. The fire regime, fires that were happening one in every 10 years are now happening 10 times a year. So we're seeing the whole Earth system change in very profound ways. And so the path forward is clearly mitigation. We've got to do something about decarbonizing our economies and reducing the emission of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But the other piece of the coin is climate change is upon us. These gases, particularly carbon dioxide, has a very long atmosphere lifetime. So it's going to be around for a long time, even if we make dramatic dr decreases in carbon emissions today. So we have to think about adapting to a changed Earth system. And that, oops. And that is the topic of our Congress this year, building resilience to climate change. So I think we're going to have a very, very um, exciting couple of days. I hope, you, I hope you get to meet some new people. I hope you get to brainstorm about some solutions. I hope you get to think about perhaps new research programs that we can launch to tackle the issue of resilience. 
I do encourage you to follow us online. Um, you'll I don't know what's happening. Um, I do encourage you to follow us online. We have a good Twitter feed um, that will let you pose questions and follow the discussion if you're, if you're away. And uh, just by way of conclusion, I want to give a little shout out um, that we'll have a workshop coming up on using the university as a living laboratory. We're thinking about um, our ICAP goals, our climate reduction goals on campus, and how to build them into our research portfolio by making some connections. And there will be a seed funding program related to using campus as a living laboratory. So I'd very much encourage you to, to attend our, our, Wednesday, uh, our Wednesday workshop. Well, without further ado, I'll introduce Lisa Ainsworth. Lisa Ainsworth will be moderating our, our first session. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to our first session of the morning on regional climate effects and building resilience. Um, so this morning, we're gonna have a series of 20-minute talks, and that'll be followed by a panel session. So I'd ask that you hold your questions until the panel session, and then all of the speakers will be up on um, up here um, to answer those questions. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Professor Don Wubbles. Um, he's the Preble Endowed Professor of Atmospheric Science um, and a Presidential Fellow at the University of Illinois. Um, amongst many other things, he helped lead the 2013 IPCC, International Assessment of Climate Change, and the 2014 um, National Climate Assessment. And so uh, he's well poised to speak to us this morning about the Climate Science Special Report and Assessment of the Science in Climate Change. All right, thank, thank you. you. I'm going to do my best. We'll see. There we go. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so I'm going to give you a little overview of the report that got leaked to the New York Times about a month ago um, that uh, very recently we just got approved by the agencies uh, and, and by the White House. And so we're now going to get it ready for publication. So this is kind of a preview because officially this isn't out yet. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So the Climate Science Special Report is an assessment of the science of climate change, looking at what we know and what we don't know. Um, and it was, it's serving as volume one of the fourth national climate assessment. Uh, the rest, volume two, looks at the impacts on society of climate change, but also we'll have a chapter on the science within it as well. Uh, kind of a summary chapter uh, from, from this big 600-page report that, that I just led uh, for the government. So what I'm going to do today is just really just talk about science, but the rest of the National Climate Assessment will be talking extensively about the potential impacts uh, on, on the American people. Both volumes are, are heavily oriented at what's happening in the United States and what will happen over the, this century and perhaps beyond. Uh, this report was written by uh, about 32 authors plus uh, some contributing authors as well, it's led by three uh, uh, can't think of the term, um, major authors that, that kind of oversee the whole thing, uh, and I'm one of those. Um, and we have a science steering committee comprised of uh, members of different agencies. It's been extensively reviewed. We had a public review back in December and January, a National Academy of Sciences review that occurred about the same time, and several different reviews by U.S. agencies, actually three of them, I think, over the last year now, um, to uh, make sure that we got input uh, as much as possible. And I think it's turned out to be a, a quite a quite a good volume. And we even used review editors who were not member of the author team to make sure that our responses were appropriate um, as we uh, went through the, the responding to these re various review comments. The objectives um, is to provide an updated detailed analysis of findings on how the climate change is affecting the weather and the climate across the United States. It's designed to be an authoritative assessment of the science of climate change with a particularly a focus on the United States. And it's serving as a foundation for efforts to assess climate-related risk and inform decision-making about responses. Um, and, and as such, uh, 
is particularly an input into the rest of the National Climate Assessment, which is why we got a six-month head start on the rest of the assessment so that we could provide all of these analyses uh, to the other authors that were looking at potential impacts in society. There are 15 chapters. The first five are really oriented looking at the, what's happening globally and various aspects of that, uh, the considerations of the forcing of climate change and what's driving the changes, um, looking at detection and attribution, a number of different aspects. Then a, a series of chapters that look primarily at the United States and what impacts we're seeing now and projected into the future. Um, then we look at the oceans and uh, what's happening with sea level rise and ocean acidification, changes in circulation in the ocean and other aspects. Uh, and we finish up with two chapters very different than anything done in, in prior assessments. One looks at climate mitigation. How would mitigation actions potentially affect what climate we actually see over the coming decades? Uh, so it's really going back to the science, uh, but looking at how mitigation could affect that. And then finally, we finish up with potential surprises, kind of things John Holdren talked about last night, where uh, we could be in for some surprises in the climate, tipping points and uh, other aspects, some things that have not been considered, or what happens if you have two major type of events happen at the same time, a major um, Heat wave combined with a drought. We tend to look at these separately in terms of the potential impacts in society. We tend not to look at them together. Some of the major findings include that new observations and new research have increased our understanding of past, current, and future climate change. Since the third national climate assessment, which was published in 2014, we have stronger evidence for continuing rapid human-caused warming of the, of the global atmosphere and ocean, extremely likely, which means 95 percent probability, that human, or more, um, that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century. For the warming over the, 20th, the last century, there is no convincing alternative explanation supported by the extent of the observational evidence. Significant advances have also been made in understanding of extreme weather events and how they relate to increasing global temperatures and associated climate change. Trends are expected to continue in such events. If we look at the bottom line from this assessment and, and prior assessments, such as the IPCC assessment in, in 2013, we come to very similar conclusions, that our climate is changing. It's changing now. It's not sometime in the future. It's happening extremely rapidly. In fact, it's going about 10 times the speed that we have seen naturally since the end of the last ice age. Um, so this is, so within human experience, we've, we've never seen anything like this. Um, sea levels are rising. Extreme weather is getting, be, becoming more intense. I'll give you a few examples of these things. It's not the temperature increase that matters here. It's really the changes in severe weather and sea level rise that affect humans. But part of that extreme weather, of course, is extreme heat. It's largely happening because of human activities, and the climate will continue to change over the coming decades. So we will need to adapt to these changes, as John was talking about last night. If we look at the temperature record, we've seen roughly a, about a 2 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature throughout the world, slightly less than that over the last century. Um, if you look at the, the last five decades, we've had a significant increase in temperature each of those decades. So we've, most of the change we've seen has occurred since 1960. The, um, if we look globally, um, most of that change is, uh, the red here indicates an increase in temperature, or orange, whatever color it's showing up as. Um, and blue would indicate a cooling. The gray means we don't have enough data. So this is looking at the period, 30-year time period, which is the kind of period we talked about for climate, 1986 to 2015, relative in this case to 1901 to 1960. And um, we particularly see the largest changes over land masses, not surprising because the oceans have a large heat capacity. Um, the one area that is cooling 
significantly is uh, off the coast of Greenland, where both melting sea ice and land ice is uh, affecting the ocean circulation, and affecting the oceans, and then because you're getting all, a, a, a lot of fresh water into the salt water in that region, um, affecting uh, the oceans there. If we look globally, 2016, last year was the warmest year in record. 2015 was the warmest year before that, and was much larger than any prior year in human in our, in our human record since the 1880s. Um, but the next year, next largest year was 2014. It's now looking like 2017 will be the second warmest year. We do not expect it every year to be warmer than the other. This last three years has been actually quite as surprising. But nonetheless, 16 of the 17, of 16 of the last 17 years, so since 2000, have been the warmest years on record for the planet since we started those observations. Looking at the, uh, focusing on the United States, um, like with the rest of the planet, we've seen a significant warming. The, the U.S. is actually one, one of the, the one other area besides that ocean, the, that part of the Atlantic Ocean um, near Greenland, where we actually see a little bit of cooling in some places. Um, particularly in the southeast, we don't fully understand whether this is related to some changes in circulation, which are quite possible, or the major deforestation that occurred in the 1800s and the reforestation that occurred in this last century uh, may be affecting that region. Um, my joke is that if you, probably the, the cooler, coolest area here is right over Huntsville, Alabama, where some of the several major uh, deniers of climate change live, and so it wouldn't dare warm in that area. But, in any case, most of the warming has, up to this point has occurred in winter, uh, but uh, that's likely to change in, in the future. If we look at precipitation, we've only seen small changes overall in precipitation, but nonetheless, what we generally see worldwide and also to some degree in the U.S. is that the wetter getting wetter and the drier getting drier. So we've seen significant uh, drying of the southwest and to some degree the southeast. More important is what we're seeing in terms of changing trends in extreme weather and extreme events. One way we see, know that this is having an impact is that since 1980, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration has been tracking what are called the $1 billion events. Now, they do take into account inflation here, but we used to have a couple of these events every year near the, when they started these, this, uh, um, tracking, and more recently, we've had about 10 plus such events every year. Um, and the total cost has been uh, $1.1 trillion over uh, since 1980. So we would expect some of these events every year, but we don't expect the, generally the increase. A similar analysis taken around the world by several different uh, large reinsurance companies um, has finds a very similar finding. Overall, we're seeing an increase in some particular extreme events. Heat waves are generally becoming um, increasing in number and becoming in more intense. They're likely to become longer and more severe. Cold waves generally are decreasing. It doesn't mean we can't have a cold wave, we will, but less cold waves uh, are expected uh, now into the future than we've had in the past. More precipitation is coming as larger events and warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor that should lead to larger uh, precipitation events when it does rain or snow and that's exactly what we're observing. Increasing risk of floods as a result in some regions, particularly in our case the, uh, the northeast and midwest of the United States. Droughts are increasing in some other regions, particularly the southwest and southeast. By mid-century, we might expect that most areas of the, of the U.S. will be affected more by drought than they have been in the past. We're seeing an increasing intensity in Atlantic hurricanes. I'm not intending to focus in on the hurricanes, but we do 
expected increasing intensity, and to some degree we know that all weather today is being affected by the changes in climate, and that includes the storms we have, we've seen recently. Some things we still don't know enough. Tornadoes and hail, we expect some increase in intensity. There's some, some uh, data suggesting that that has occurred and is, uh, is occurring now in, in, in the projections as well, but the data is not very good and it's highly uncertain. So we're still trying to understand what that means. So if we look at extreme precipitation, we've seen a significant increase over last, over past decades uh, across the U.S. Uh, what's shown on the left is the two-day um, five-year events. On the right is the 99th percentile change, and you can see the largest changes have been in the Northeast and then the Midwest. What is causing climate change? Many lines of evidence de demonstrate that human activities, especially emissions of greenhouse gases, are primarily responsible for what we've observed. For the period extending over the last century, there are no credible alternative explanations supported by the extent of the observational record. Solar output changes and natural variability can only contribute very small amounts to the observed change in climate over this time period, and there are no natural cycles found in the observational record that can explain the observed changes in climate. Looking at the future, we expect uh, because emissions of uh, these greenhouse gases are continuing to occur uh, in significant amounts, um, we generally expect an increase, uh, a further significant increase over the coming decades in emissions and resulting concentrations of these gases and what that means in temperature, but we can affect that greatly by our choices. And we can get to the point of trying to keep the temperature below two degrees um, Celsius, about three degrees Fahrenheit, um, by uh, 3.8 degrees Fahrenheit by, uh, uh, by trying to do something about these emissions. That has a significant effect, as John showed last night again, on the resulting projections of climate change. These look at four different scenarios going all the way from continuing the pathway we're on, which is, in, which is heavily, heavily using fossil fuels, which are the primary source of the increase in carbon dioxide and also contributes heavily to methane um, increase. And down to uh, scenarios where we could really cut back emissions greatly over the century. Over the next few decades, you, need, you see very little differences in the temperatures worldwide um, between these different scenarios because the emissions we've already made are going to drive the changes we're going to see over the next few decades. By mid-century, that's no longer the case, and if you go at the end of the century, which is the last column, you can see significant differences between those different scenarios. And in the, most, the warmest case, we're talking about uh, temperatures in the U.S. as as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit larger than uh, than we have currently. That's a very significant change. If you think about the last ice age, that was about 13, 14 degrees Fahrenheit decrease. And so we're talking about something really, and that, we know that that meant most of the North America was covered with ice. Um, that's a very different world, and what we're projecting for this century, this is even going beyond this century, uh, in the way of temperature increase with that high case uh, would also mean a very different world than we're used to. And we have significant impacts on our children and our grandchildren. There are uncertainties in this, and if we look at what the changes uh, are, uh, they the near term is really affected by the natural variability in, in the Earth's system. Um, I won't get into that, but in the midterm, it's more the model uncertainty. But in the end, what really matters is the emissions. So by mid-century and beyond, it's what those emissions actually are. Severe events, as I've already mentioned, are likely to, to also uh, be affected. This just shows the number of days of increase in, in, in days greater than 90 degrees and we see a significant increase in such days throughout most of the U.S. Um, over, um, 
over the continental United States. And likewise, if we work, look at the days below 32 degrees, there's significantly fewer such days uh, over the century. As I mentioned before, extreme precipitation is likely to continue. This is, again, two-day duration, five-year return events, uh, looking at uh, seven different areas of the United States. And we, in each case, we project an increase. More extreme rainfall, of course, can lead to more flash floods. This shows uh, one of my former students is in Lubbock, Texas. This is a picture she took of a, of a flash flood that happened there um, over the last few years. We're seeing significant changes already happening in the oceans. We've had an increase in sea level of about eight inches. Uh, that's the highest in the last 6,000 years. Um, we're also seeing acidification, the increase in carbon dioxide. About 25% of that CO2 ends up in the oceans. It's making the oceans less basic, and that has potential significant impact on uh, certain life forms in, in the oceans and on the food chain. Over this century, we expect a one to four additional increase, feet increase in sea level. So one to four feet increase in sea level over the, uh, um, globally. Um, but we can't throw out the possibility it could be as high as eight and a half feet. And that's because there's a lot of concern about what's going on in West Antarctica and whether we could see a sliding of the glacier basically into the ocean over this century. We're already seeing nuisance flooding in many uh, cities on the east and west coast of the United States. Um, nuisance flooding means whenever there's a high tide, uh, the streets near the oceans are getting, getting flooded. Um, this has been a, a problem in the past, but only a few hours at a time in the past. Now it's becoming multiple days. And as sea level continues to increase, it's going to become more and more of an issue. Overall, if we look at one meter, a little over three feet increase in sea level worldwide, and say, well, what does that mean to U.S. coast? Much of the U.S. coast, particularly in the east and south, southern coast, are likely to see more than that um, because of the fact that the land is sinking. The effects of waves are driving more increase towards the um, United States. So some areas, instead of having three plus, you know, a little over three feet, might seem more like six feet, five and six feet. Um, and that includes the New Orleans and uh, uh, Houston areas. We do know that already that the com combination of sea level rise, including the eight inches we've already seen, um, when there is a large storm, like uh, recent hurricanes, uh, combining that with storm surge can lead to very significant problems. So I'm going to finish with just talking a little bit about a personal message. Um, this is not in the report, but I do want, I, I, the science can be very depressing, and I know that. I give a lot of public talks, um, but I, I don't like, you know, usually I will talk about uh, you know, potential policy options and other things. We don't have time for that. But I do want to leave you with a sense of hope. Our future does depend on which choice we make. Which of those emissions pathways are we going to follow? Adaption is not a choice. Adaptation is not a choice. Um, our choice is whether to adapt proactively or respond to the consequences. So far, we've been doing a pretty good job of responding to the consequences instead of trying to adapt. Adaptation does require a paradigm shift, focusing on managing risk. But we can draw on our long history as humans, to responding to changing conditions around us to do something about this issue. I'll finish with one last quote. This is from Sir David King, um, science advisor to two different UK prime ministers, uh, and previously head of the chemistry department at the University of Cambridge. Um, uh, Sir David retired recently, but is someone I know uh, reasonably well um, while he was still um, high up in the government in the UK. But a few years ago, he said, climate change is not the biggest challenge of our time. It's the biggest challenge of all time. And we need to be thinking more about what that means, not only to us, but to our children and grandchildren. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And as I mentioned before, we'll have a panel at the end after all three talks. Um, so let me get the next talk up here. It's now a pleasure to in introduce um, Professor Thomas Hurdle. He's the Distinguished Professor of um, Agricultural Economics at Purdue. Um, and his research focuses on international trade, food, and environmental security. Uh, amongst many other things, he's the founder and executive director of the Global Trade Analysis Project, which encompasses more than 15,000 researchers in 170 countries uh, around the world. And they maintain a global economic database um, for, for mo and a modeling framework um, that he's um, written about in his book, Global Trade Analysis, Modeling and Applications. Um, today, he's going to speak to us about assessing the interregional incidence of climate impacts on agriculture. Thank you. That's great. Okay, well, it's a real honor to be here, and I um, am uh, humbled to follow that last talk, um, a masterful overview of climate change. I'm going to focus in particularly on impacts on agriculture, and I'm going to focus on a particular dimension of that, um, namely the geographical pattern of effects um, across the world and try to better understand the interrelationship between the biophysical elements of that geography and the economic geography. My co-authors on this work are Joris Baldos at Purdue University and Francis Moore at UC Davis. So I think we've made a lot of progress in the last decade on understanding the climate impacts on agriculture. Um, among other things, the AGMIT project has brought together hundreds of researchers around the world and systematically improved the methods in this area. Um, I think we are less far along on understanding the impacts for particular policy relevant variables. I'm going to focus on national economic welfare as a simple metric, um, <clears throat> but there are many others that uh, need to be further drawn out, particularly related to food and food security in the environment. So the geographic distribution of welfare impacts around the world depends on the biophysical factors. Think, for example, the differential pattern of, um, <coughs> of warming for one degree, two degrees, or whatnot across the globe. Different grid cells, different regions are affected differently. And the economic factors. So who do you trade with? Do you trade, do you import from a country that is likely to be severely affected by climate change? So we're interested in how those two interact, and that's, we're doing a deep dive into that question in this paper and in this talk. For this, we'll leverage a recent meta-analysis of climate impacts on crops uh, that was developed by Fran Moore, and this is combined with the GTAP model. You heard about that. That's been around quite a long time. It's a model of global trade analysis that's suitable for this particular question. So this is the overview of our method. We've got this meta-analysis, which I'll talk about further about in a moment, that's a statistical um, relationship uh, between um, the change in yields for a given crop in a given grid cell um, around the world and um, as a function of a variety of variables. And this summarizes um, more than a thousand um, <coughs> impacts that were collected uh, for the last IPCC report. So that statistical model is going to be our engine for understanding biophysical components, and the GTAP model will help us translate that into economic welfare and, um, and the economic components. So Fran has a paper. Um, we were co fortunate to be co-authors on that. This was published earlier in Environmental Research Letters in 2017. And it's a, a meta-analysis of, as I said, uh, uh, more than 1,000 estimates of climate impacts for wheat, rice, maize, and soybeans. And these were all studies collected um, in the context of the last IPCC report. Um, personally, when I was trying to make sense of, for example, the, you know, the 36,000 global gridded results generated by AGMIP, it was very bewildering. And I found this meta-analysis quite refreshing, and perhaps you will as well. Um, and um, it incorporates variables including average growing season temperature, so are you in a cold region or a warm region, the change in temperature um, for a given um, uh, extent of global warming, the, um, the precipitation, atmospheric CO2 change, and whether adaptation is considered or not. 
And one of the most important things out of this paper, I think, is uh, to show formally, statistically, that um, once you control for all these factors, the predictions on, based on process models are quite consistent with those based on the statistical models. So that for a time, there were the two families of, of um, <coughs> methodologies of group, uh, groups of people who were kind of arguing, saying, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. Turns out, once you control for all of these things, they're quite consistent. And uh, that's the theme of this special issue in ERL. More generally, I encourage you to look at it if you have an interest in this area. The climate experiments we'll be doing are very simple. One degree, two degree, three degree C global temperature rise. We'll be pattern scaling those temperatures across the globe according to the CMIP ensemble um, and RCP 8.5. So these are the results, and uh, these are the results of the ERL paper. Um, these are global gridded yield impacts of climate change at two degrees global mean temperature rise. So first of all, I want you to know, well, there are four crops. There are really only four crops that have been sufficiently studied to perform, to, to have a kind of robust meta-analysis. So I want you to note that the impacts across these crops are quite different both the overall intensity, um, how much there is of this kind of brownish gray stuff there is at the bottom versus the green, which is good stuff, which happens when there's CO2 fertilization, you're at high, um, <coughs> at, 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 at low initial temperatures, and so on. Take a look at the bottom here, rice on the left and soy, soybean on the right, and you can see, uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about Brazil and South America um, and also China. Um, but you can see that for soybeans um, in Brazil, there are quite significant effects um, predicted at two degrees uh, Celsius. They're starting from a high temperature. Soy is vulnerable to those temperature increases. On the other hand, rice um, <coughs> shows, you know, some uh, is, is more robust at, um, to climate change. And you can see both in South America, but also I'll, I'll draw your attention to China, some, uh, some, uh, some modest uh, yield increases at this uh, global mean temperature rise. So a lot of variation geographically across crops. We want to understand that better, how it translates into national economic welfare. So let's start with the biophysical determinants. So we're going to start working over this meta-analysis. And um, we're going to worry about the fact that crops differ in, in, in temperature sensitivity. There are uneven great rates of global warming across the, row, uh, the globe and different responses in cold versus warm uh, regions. So we've got four experiments we do here. Um, E4 is the final one, and that has all the geography in it. And we're going to then work by subtraction uh, to, to understand these different biophysical determinants of geography. So the first thing is initial temperature. We know that um, uh, if you're starting out in Canada at a low initial temperature, the temperature rise will have a very different effect than if you're starting out in Brazil at a high initial temperature. So we're going to remove that impact by, in this meta-analysis, we're going to plug in instead of the, um, <coughs> uh, the gridded um, uh, initial temperature for the growing season for that particular crop, we're going to plug in the global mean temperature. So we'll control for initial temperature. E4 minus E3 tells us the impact of initial temperature on welfare around the world. Then we'll take a, take a crack at pattern scaling. So we'll remove the pattern scaling. And finally, we'll remove the differential impact on different crops. So this is E4. This is, has full geography in there, but has no trade element to this. So in some sense, no economic geography. We're just decomposing the contribution of the direct climate impacts around the world to national economic welfare. So you can see um, the biggest adverse effects in South America. I'd already flagged soybeans as a potential issue. You saw significant yield effects. And these are economic welfare. In economic ease, we talk about equivalent variation. You can think about this as real income changes, and we've divided this by, normalized by output value for the four crops we're looking at. We're not looking at all the economy. We're really just looking at a small part of it. So it's been normalized in that way. So you can see um, China, on the other hand, some beneficial effects, um, and you saw that in some of the, uh, the yield impacts for rice. Um, so a very different pattern across the globe just looking at translating these direct climate impacts 
into economic welfare terms. Let's understand this a little more. Let's take out the initial temperature effect by <clears throat> going into this meta-analysis and those T, upper, T bars you see, they're grid and crop specific initial temperatures. We're gonna set those all at the global mean value. And then by subtracting E3 from E4, we get the contribution of initial temperature to welfare. So the fact that the temperature's higher through the tropics means that Brazil suffers from having a high initial temperature. Canada, on the other hand, benefits from having a low initial temperature. Now let's look at pattern scaling, another biophysical element of the geography of climate impacts on agriculture. This is the pattern scaling of climate um, for a one degree C increase in global mean temperature according to the CMIP 5 ensemble mean under RCP 8.5. And you can see in the northern latitudes some very high temperature increases. So very uneven pattern of uh, temperature rise. So we, con we control for this by saying, well, we'll give everyone in the world the global mean temperature change, and we'll subtract that off. What's the effect of pattern scaling on welfare? Well, now Brazil at the tropical level benefits a bit from the pattern scaling. Canada's hurt from the pattern scaling. Finally, we look at crop composition because we saw that Brazil, well, we, we saw the differential pattern, say, for soybeans and rice. We know Brazil grows a lot of soybeans, less rice. China grows a lot of rice. What's that contribution? And we simply average these yield impacts. Um, <coughs> and so we get uh, kind of a single composite impact function across the four crops. And this shows the effect of crop composition. So again, Brazil lights up in a big way, um, <coughs> uh, the US as well, um, due to the soybean emphasis, and Asia benefits because rice is more. Um, the crop composition, the shift towards rice, uh, allows um, a, a lesser, um, or in fact, beneficial biophysical impact. So crop composition is beneficial in Asia, adverse in much of the Americas. Okay, so we've looked through the biophysical uh, determinants. If everyone in the world were affected the same way, economics wouldn't matter. Okay, the trade patterns wouldn't matter. You, everyone's affected the same way. So now I'm interested in taking apart the trade part. How does the trade interact with this biophysical geography? So economic geography and biophysical geography interacting. So the sufficient statistic here is terms of trade. What happens to a country's export prices relative to its import prices? That's the country's terms of trade. And that's what we're going to focus on. So you can expect if you're a country that's importing a commodity that's hard hit like soybeans, think China, you're gonna be hurt on your terms of trade uh, because the price is gonna go up for that product. If you're importing rice, uh, that won't be the case. So if you're a net importer of commodities with rising world prices, that hurts. If you source your imports like China does from Brazil from a region that's hard hit, you're gonna be hit again on top of that. And on the other hand, you could be benefiting from the terms of trade, as Brazil does. When, so I'm showing you from this um, experiment. This is E4. All of the elements of biophysical geography are in there. Braz China's hurt on their terms of trade. Brazil benefits. Well, what does that mean? They don't benefit overall, but they push some of the costs out to the other countries. China bears some of the cost of climate change in Brazil. This is a sharing of that burden. And it's happens through the trade, through, through the terms of trade. So you can see this is the pattern of terms of trade change. Over there we have the pat biophysical pattern. We'll put these together towards the end. I want to understand the terms of trade more. The terms of trade are actually complicated. There are 140 countries in this model and every one of them has a different impact on the other 140 countries. So it's really a big matrix of results that's way too much to present here. I've just presented for major exporters, you'll see rest of world there, um, you'll see Brazil, Argentina, and the US um, on the, on the, uh, uh, along the rows. But there are 140 of, the, of those rows. I'm gonna zoom in on a few of these rows and cells to highlight this. But um, with the kind of the GTAP modeling technology, we've been able to take apart 
all, um, disaggregate the cells in all of this 140 by 140 matrix of interactions. Let's focus on the U.S. Climate change in the U.S., who does it affect around the world? How does it affect other countries? <clears throat> so starting out in the U.S., pushing out to the, to the rest of the world. Well, Brazil benefits. And if something bad happens in the U.S., Brazil benefits. They just take over some of the U.S. soybean market or maize. Um, China is hurt because China imports soybeans and maize from the U.S. So that pattern, this is the pattern of sharing <laughs> the way U.S. Sh generously shares its climate impacts around the world. Um, we can focus on one element of that, which is just China. This is the same map, but I've arrow zoomed in on China. You can look at one element or you can look at the whole, the whole row. We can look at Brazil. How does Brazil affect um, other countries around the world when it comes to its climate impacts? This is the map of that. So Brazil sharing this cost out around the world, and you can see uh, again, the U.S. benefits because the U.S. is a competitor with Brazil in export markets. China's hurt again. Um, much of Africa is hurt. Um, <clears throat> we can also look at a column in this table. What does that say? That says, for a given country, say, I'm China. Who's affecting me? I, sh I showed you Brazil and the U.S., but how is everyone else affecting me? Who's affecting me, in this case, as a major importer and the world's largest agricultural producer? And that's what this figure shows. So. Um, Who's affecting me most severely? Brazil, followed by the U.S. They actually benefit from their imports um, uh, <coughs> from Canada in this case, because recall, Canada is the northern latitude. It's affected um <coughs> beneficially in some cases. So, so China is affected by all the countries around the world, but think about where they source the bulk of their, their imports, the agricultural imports, are soybeans. The bulk of those soybeans are coming from the Brazil and, Brazil and the U.S. These are two regions that are quite exposed to climate change. So this raises a, a resilience issue. Is your pattern of trade one that is resilient or not? They're very specialized and very specialized by commodity and geographic region and so very exposed in that sense, in an economic sense, to this bio ge uh, biophysical geography of trade. So we've talked about biophysical determinants, economic geography. There's one other component. So when you fully decompose the sources of welfare change in each country around the world, there's one more component I haven't talked about, and that's policy. So it turns out, according to economic theory um, and um, <coughs> a measurement in this case, if you're China and you happen to expand soybean production in the northeast of China in response to these higher prices, and soybeans are already heavily subsidized, you're doing something that's costing your economy efficiency. So that's what we call allocative efficiency. So that's the last piece of it. I've circled it here. Um, so there are four comp three components driving national welfare. One is the direct effect. That's what we're getting from the agronomists that the climate scientists in team, teamed up with the agronomists. That's the direct effect. So you can see in that ca case, China's benefiting. You go to the terms of trade, and because of this generous sharing from the other regions, especially the U.S. and Brazil, their terms of trade deteriorate. And in addition, their allocative efficiency deteriorates. So overall, China loses when you factor in these other components. So that's important. It's important not just to look at the direct biophysical effects. They were benefiting there. Now they're losing. They're losing because of the economic geography of the problem. And this just shows that this is relative to crop value. This is relative to economists would prefer this relative to expenditure as a true welfare measure. And this just shows you that when you look at it that way, the region that really jumps out at you, um, South America, but also parts of Africa, South Asia. So I want to wrap up here uh, to stay on time. Uh, the geographical dis distribution of welfare impacts due to climate change in agriculture depends on both the biophysical and the economic components. If there are no biophysical differences, the econ economics doesn't matter. Okay, So it's really the interaction that's important. We built into our analysis the current pattern of trade around the world, as well as how that trade responds to price changes. But there is a geography there. And 
that geography raises questions about resilience. So China, in this case, showing um, a, a singular lack of resilience to climate change at two degrees because of their sourcing of products, uh, both commodity-wise and geographic-wise. So here are my two fantastic collaborators, uh, Uris Baldos, a research assistant professor at Purdue, Fran Moore, assistant professor at UC Davis. They're terrific. Um, and um, we have a paper, Fran's leading it, coming out. I just wanted to give you a bit of advance notice on that, coming out um, in Nature Communications in the next few weeks. Um, and that will show, using the same meta-analysis, that um, taking one of the widely used integrated assessment models, if you build this meta-analysis in, and in that sense, build in all the science from the last IPCC round into the fund model, you double the social cost of carbon. So we're just talking about improving the science on agriculture. I don't, not talking about the other sectors, but you double the social cost of carbon. That really changes one's view of investments in the future and um, uh, the relative importance of, of mitigation. So um, I think that's very important work. My hat's off really to Fran who led this meta-analysis. Um, I think it's really important and we've, um, um, we've tried to draw out some of the, more uh, uh, the other implications here. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. Okay, and our final speaker this morning before the panel is Dr. Kaiyu Guan. Um, he's an assistant professor in natural resources and environmental sciences here at the University of Illinois. And this morning he's going to talk to us about the impact and adaptation of agroecosystems to climate change in the U.S. Corn Belt. Thanks, Lisa, and uh, it's a great honor to be here. I'm extremely humbled uh, as the first speaker of this session. And today, we will talk about impact and adaptation of uh, agroecosystem to climate change uh, in the U.S. Corn Belt. So we are talking about our backyard. Um, and uh, just uh, the work. So this is, this is about our Corn Belt. On the left side, we show a um, U.S. map, but we also identify the major crop areas that grow corn, uh, as well as the minor area in the color of dark green and the shallow green. And uh, if you see for different states, there's a number that indicates what's the percentage of the total U.S. corn production uh, that produced in that specific county, uh, in that specific state uh, in, the, in the percentage. So for example, Illinois produced about 17% of the total U.S. corn production. And, uh, and Iowa ranked number, uh, number one, and I, uh, Nebraska also has 12%. So we get a sense about where we are looking at, and this is the region that I'm gonna target uh, for this specific talk. So we primarily talk about the corn belt that grow corn, soybean. And uh, as you may know, the U.S. is the biggest corn, soybean production area combined. So we produce about 40% of the total global uh, corn and we produce about 25% of the total, total global soybean production. And so uh, U.S. production is extremely important and the, the impact of the climate change may possibly have a huge impact on this production. And on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the right side, you may curious what's that. And this is actually the photosynthesis inferred by the solar induced fluorescence from the satellite for the summertime uh, of 2014. And the, the, the very blowing and the red color-ish uh, refers to you know high uh, uh, intensity of photosynthesis and uh, f just from this satellite image you actually can see that during the summer in the U.S. Uh, U.S. corn belt are actually doing photosynthesis like crazy. It's it's doing photosynthesis more than uh, you know uh, the 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 Florida uh, wetland as well as the New England forest. So it's it's the hot spot of doing uh, uh, taking the carbon from the atmosphere. Now before I uh, uh, go deep into the, the crops and the climate change, I would like to uh, just give you a very first order understanding about what we care about when we think about crop growth. And we care about sunshine. We care about water. We care about, uh, you know, these are the primary two things that we care about. And when we talk about crop, we really, uh, 
in many times we focus on the leaf level that uh, we know this leaf has this stom uh, these pore systems called stomata that take the water in uh, and get the, uh, sorry take the CO2 in and get the water out and uh, and then these uh, basically this is a uh, this system basically fix the carbon from the atmosphere, release the water, and at the same time, the fix the carbon become the biomass, and part of the biomass become the grain. And this is essentially the, 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 the crop, how crop grow in the very first order. Now, in this specific talk, I will actually cover three aspects. So we will talk about the climate change projections in the US corn bill. And then we will talk about the impact, the projected impact primarily on two things. One is crop yield, the other is water resources. And uh, specifically, we're gonna heavily focus on the crop yield because that's, we, that's what we really care about. And then uh, uh, towards the end of the talk, I will uh, discuss about some potential adaptations that we can possibly have. Now let's first uh, talk about the first one, mm, climate change projection. And uh, I think uh, uh, Don's talk make this part uh, for me extremely easy, so I will just jump into uh, the results and the focus on the US corn bill. And so this is the graph actually from the previous uh, national assessment uh, 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 led by Jerry Manilo. And so on the precipitation change, so this is basically a graph that shows, uh, uh, compared the, towards the end of the century, the rainfall pattern uh, and compared with uh, the, the, the current stage. So you, what we care about primarily is spring and the summertime rainfall. And the people may care us that the crop primarily grow towards the, uh, during the summertime. And why we care about the spring? And actually spring is very important because we have a deep soil. We, our soil can not, is not only nutritious, uh, contain a lot of soil organic carbon, but at the same time, our soil here can store a lot of water. And uh, basically if the water bucket is empty or filled, matters a lot. So that makes spring rainfall extremely important. And the summer rainfall, of course, it's important uh, as it's the growing season. Now from this projection uh, from the previous re uh, national assessment report, we will see that actually spring rainfall increase in the corn belt. Uh, and during the summer, uh, the corn belt rainfall actually uh, you know, sh uh, show no significant impact, slight small change. Now I will, I will cover this later, but spring time rainfall actually increase uh, but also, at the same time, they increase in a very intense way. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna experience a lot of intense rainfall uh, instead of, you know, we have drizzles everywhere. So we will have more intense rainfall. And actually this year we experienced that in the corn belt. At the beginning of uh, about May, uh, we experienced a lot of heavy rainfall and that heavy rainfall actually has a huge impact on the crop production. And uh, we will discuss in a few minutes. So this is the rainfall pattern. The temperature pattern, and so if we look at the red box, which refers to the worst climate change scenario, the, towards the end of the century, we will uh, uh, experience about four to five degrees C increase in temperature projected for the US corn belt. And that's, that's a very significant change. Uh, of course, we're talking about the worst uh, you know, business scenario. Now, temperature has uh, an impact, as Tom already uh, mentioned. Now, uh, if we you know, go deeper into the process of why temperature matters. There's actually a lot of processes that we care about. Now, primarily based on our current study, we believe that the uh, process that temperature really affects the crop is actually through the VPD, so-called vapor pressure deficit. And the VPD is an indicator of atmospheric dryness. Now, so give you some idea about what is VPD. If you look at the graph in the middle, uh, so we have the leaf, and leaf usually have uh, the leaf vapor pressure. And then we have the air, uh, has the air vapor pressure. Uh, the basic physics, physics law actually tell us that as you increase temperature, uh, the vapor pressure, uh, the saturated vapor pressure will have an exponential increase. So in other words that basically if we have the higher temperature, usually the vapor pressure deficit defined as the difference between these two. So that will increase also close to uh, 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 exponential increase. This means that if the temperature increase, our atmosphere can hold more water, at the same time, our atmosphere become drier. And the, the, the consequence of atmosphere become drier is that basically atmosphere creates a drought condition that they need more water suck out of the soil as well as the plants. 
And uh, as a response to that, plants tend to close their stomata. They tend to stop doing photosynthesis. And that leads to uh, potentially a, a, a photosynthesis reduction. But also, if plants slowly close, but that gradient between the atmosphere and the leaf for the vapor pressure, we call the vapor, vapor VPD. If the VPD is high enough, they're gonna still draw water out of the leaf, inside the, inside the plant. And that actually creates a, a, an active condition. So basically we expect that the higher temperature leads to higher vapor pressure deficit, and the higher vapor pressure deficit creates the atmospheric dryness that really stress the crops. Now, uh, we talk about drought a lot in here, and, and people talk about 2012 drought, historical droughts, and uh, if we look at the historical data, we actually find that the drought that traditionally we think about, which means the, the lack of rainfall. You know, in the U.S. Corn Bill, we don't experience tons of lack of rainfall si situations. Even 2012, if you lump all the yield together, our 2012 rainfall is not that bad compared with the historical you know, situation. Now, what matters most, we believe, is really the, the, the spring. So two things that kick in. One thing is the vapor pressure deficit, we believe, really stressed out the plants. Not in the sense that uh, the soil moisture, which refers to this graph. So if you think the plant as a, a continue, you actually stressed by both sides. You have the supply side, which is from the soil. You have the demand side, which is from the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is, uh, demand is primarily controlled by VPD. And we believe a lot of the stress is actually come from the VPD side instead of the soil stress, soil moisture side. And soil moisture is essentially, um, empirical study shows that it's less limiting, but the VPD shows a huge impact. And this specific VPD impact is highly correlated with temperature and that also significantly affects the crop production. And so this is a graph that tried to summarize this, uh, uh, the, what we uh, previously mentioned. So the rainfall, this is the annual pattern, and the, the, well, the, the, this bar shows that this is basically the uh, scaled uh, increase, scaled change versus the interannual variability. Uh, so if you see number, uh, number two, it means that the, actually the impact of that is two times uh, of the internal variability that calculated from the historical period. Now we do, ex do see that rainfall actually don't show a lot of impact in general in the corn belt. Slight, slight change if you lump, lump the whole year together. But if we look at the vapor pressure deficit, you're actually gonna experience a huge e increase of the vapor pressure deficit. And that huge increase of vapor pressure deficit I actually stress the crops and then make us really worried. And so let's move to the climate change impact. So we will focus primarily on the crop yield part, and again, we will target at the corn belt uh, the region. And this is a very famous study uh, by uh, Robert Schlenker and, uh, uh, Schlenker and Robert in 2009. And what it shows is that if they use the historical data set of the corn soybean from the county level at, uh, from the USDA uh, and uh, analyze the temperature impact, the, you will, see that the, the pattern that they show is that it's similar for corn and soybean. When the temperature is relatively low, or they don't have a lot of impact. So the x-axis is the temperature, y-axis is the log yield. Um, but then once you hit some threshold, for example, for corn, it's about 28-ish. For the soybean, it's, it's, uh, it's 29, mm, about 29. So after you past that threshold, you expect to experience a huge reduction in corn and soybean. And, and this has been revealed by the historical data set. A recent study by uh, Zhe Nongjing, uh, they used the process-based model and they feed the model uh, into, they feed the climate scenario inputs into the model. So they basically first tune the historical yield pattern and then drive the model, use the climate change impact. Um, uh, scenarios. What they discover if we look at this worst scenario, and the, the top one refers to the ones that without CO2 impact, the bottom one is plus the CO2 impact. As we know that CO2 fertilization may possibly bring the benefits to crops. And so if we see this part is corn, this part is soybean, on the, on the left side is corn, right side is soybean. So on the left side, if we see the, uh, see the corn production, we actually see that if we don't consider uh, CO2 impact, and if we consider the in the worst uh, 
you know, you know, business as usual scenario, CRP uh, 3.5, uh, 8.5, we will see a yield reduction, which is on the left side, the B panel, the yield re reduction is pretty significant, about 20 to 30% uh, decrease. But then if we add the CO2 impact, that negative impact will slightly reduced. It will be reduced to 10% to 20% and overall in the corn bill. So on the right side, we will see the soybean. And soybean actually experienced a large benefit from the CO2 fertilization. So you will see on the right side, uh, the, uh, again, the B panel shows uh, the soybean production without consideration of CO2 fertilization. And uh, so the production uh, actually reduction is even more severe than the corn. Um, if we compare the right and, and the left figures for the panel B. But then if we add the CO2 impact into the soybean, we actually see the pretty si significant impact. And I know uh, uh, the same group and Lisa uh, are working on a paper that uh, try to damage, try to use a soil phase to improve, further improve the model response. But this basically shows that uh, if we don't do anything, corn definitely will reduce their yield and with a pretty significant uh, margin. And the soil being may uh, slight, the situation may slightly better uh, because of the CO2 effect. And uh, so in other words, that the adaptation is definitely required. Now again, let's go back to the Sri Lanka rubber paper in 2009. One question that uh, make me feel very intrigued is uh, just like all the empirical studies, we see a slope after, after 25, 28, 29 degree C, you see a slope that has a, indicate a very sharp decrease of yield when you increase the temperature. And so that slope uh, revealed by the empirical studies um, make me wondering, um, you know, what's the detail of the process that really explain that? Now, some of the stories that I previously, some of the findings that we previously mentioned about VPD is part of that. But on top of that, there are also other factors that can possibly explain that temperature response from the plant, bio uh, plant biology perspective. So for example, there is photosynthesis and respiration. We all know that photosynthesis and respiration is a function of temperature. We know that growth rate uh, uh, is related to temperature and the higher temperature possibly will shorten the growing season um, for the crop growth, uh, growth cycle. And then also we know that heat stress actually can have a huge impact, especially during the re reproductive stage. That's usually when in the agronomy, people talk about harvest index. And, and again, that's the large, larger atmospheric water demands that's basically described by the vapor pressure deficit. So in one of the projects that we recently got funded, we actually try to map out all these mechanisms that can explain these Pass, pathways. So the TC increase refers to the canopy temperature increase that we're gonna definitely experience in, here in, in the in the in the comb belt. Now there are four major processes that I lay out as I mentioned previously, um, and we hope to f use the uh, the soil phase ex uh, sorry, uh, soil phase experiment uh, and the temperature heating experience, uh, experiments to test these hypotheses and then we want to use the field level data and incorporate into the crop models to really understand the process, what drives uh, the, these processes. Now w the implication of that is actually very critical because we all know that we need to do something, we need to do some adaptation. And one of the major adaptations that I will discuss in a few minutes is, is improve the crop genetics, improve the crop traits. And uh, if we don't understand the processes, how crop respond to temperature, then you basically don't have a very clear idea how, what kind of traits in the crops that we really need to improve. Whether it's about photosynthesis, whether it's about harvest index, or it's about water use efficiency. Now, I hope this study can really help us to get the first hand ideas from the experiment as well as from the process-based model so that we can give uh, the crop breeders a very good guidance on top of uh, uh, related to the climate, ad climate adaptation. Now for now, based on the, our current limited data set and our understanding, we believe this part which is related to VPD, the top, top circle, top red box related to VPD and the bottom circle related to harvest index, both play a very huge role in terms of uh, explaining the yield loss. And so give a few words about why we care about harvest index and, and the heat stress. You know, uh, 
the left side, I use a graph that is from my recent paper, but it's actually for rice. <laughs> but for corn, it's very similar because corn and rice, you know, the, these uh, cereal crops, they all experience or they all show similar growth stage, which, uh, you know, can primarily separate into the vegetative stage and the reproductive stage. So during the vegetative stage, you actually increase your biomass, increase your height, uh, expand your leaf. But then, you know, towards the end of the vegetative stage, when you enter into the reproductive stage, that's, will, that's when, you know, the grains start to form. And, and, the, and the, the, that process actually uh, can possibly has a lot to do with the heat stress. And so we believe that the vapor pressure deficit actually affects the crop growth over the whole growth period, but there is some parts of the heat stress that has significant impact just primarily during the flower stage as well as the green filling stage, which is primarily in the reproductive uh, period. And, and so, so one of the recent studies that we used the machine learning approach to assess the temperature impact or on U.S. Corn, uh, corn production at the county level says, so basically we see the x-axis, the, the, the different months, the y-axis refers to the impact of the, of the temperature uh, in Berkeley uh, on the crop yield. And you will see that July has the huge impact. And we believe that July impact has part to do with VPD, but also has a significant part to do with the harvest index. Uh, and the harvest index, actually, we do expect that they interannually change uh, uh, vary a lot, which is supported by the field level data. The one last thing that I want to mention is we talk about drought a lot. We, we really, uh, you know, we understand there's drought, drought, drought danger. However, uh, as Don actually mentioned, there's also an excessive rainfall. So excessive rainfall creates floods, for sure. But also excessive rainfall creates an uh, impact for the crop yield. So this is a study that my postdoc recently is doing that we use the RMA data refers to the risk management uh, uh, or risk management agency from the USDA, as well as the climate data and the county level yield data from USDA. So we actually map out the x-axis you can envision, this is a, a, an indicator of precipitation. Uh, so middle part means that there is very little rainfall change. And then to the left side, I'm talking about the graph on the right side. Right side. So that x-axis you think about this is rainfall. The, the on, 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 that, on that graph on the left side, that means that there's a less of rainfall, there's a lack of rainfall, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a drought condition. But on the right side, there is a, an access of rainfall. And the access of rainfall and the, the y-axis refers to the yield loss. Um, and the, actually, the graph actually shows that if we look at the whole US, the access of rainfall impact uh, for the crop yield loss is almost as much as what drought um, uh, uh, had for the, for the U.S. crop production. This further figure shows uh, the IMA, IMA uh, data from the crop insurance report for the Champaign County uh, for different years. Uh, the x-axis is actually different year. Now, different, there is different attribution of reasons. It's probably too small, but let me read it for you. So the blue one refers to drought condition. So 2012, we have a big drought. So that's indicated here. But then the shallow green one, which you see here, refers to excessive rainfall. So if you look at across the whole time series, uh, you know, starting from uh, uh, 80s, uh, you will see that most of the, the biggest reason that, cre that creates the yield loss in Champaign County is actually either excessive rainfall or drought. And, and so too much or too little, both matters. And, and so uh, actually our current model has little to do that has the capability of doing that. Now, for the sake of time, I probably will just jump to this and uh, finish my talk quickly. So I believe for corn build, uh, even going towards the future, going to still primarily uh, produce corn and soybean. And uh, th this is the reason that because corn and soybean is just so important for us, for, for, for both the U.S. Uh, as well as for the globe. So, I, I, so based on that, I believe for there are a few adaptations that I think people really think can, th can think about. So, for example, there are a lot of effort in this campus um, uh, uh, that involved in improving the crop variety. So for example, a uh, huge effort has been devoted into improve the photosynthesis, and this is definitely the, the, the way to go. But at the same time, water use efficiency, as well as more drought tolerance and heat tolerance uh, in, in the variety is important. And also, I think 
there is a, actually a trend of increased irrigation. And look, this is the historical pattern revealed from the, from the Gibbs lab in, in uh, University of Wisconsin. And we do see that in Nebraska, there's a lot of increase of irrigation. So actually, I envision that in, maybe in the future, Illinois may also need irrigation. We, know we may not need irrigation for now, but uh, possibly in 20 or 30 years or even 50 years, when in economics works, people possibly will definitely get an irrigation central pivot system to you know, counterfeit the climate change. Double cropping, uh, in the south, we double crop and the t temperature become convenient, uh, temperature is convenient and allow the double crop, basically soybean and the wheat rotation. Uh, whether it's possible in, in, in this part of the country too, uh, we, do, we do not essentially do a lot of double cropping, but as the temperature warm up, we can possibly do that. But whether there's sufficient hydrology or water resources to support that, it's a question. And, and the cover crop, and I think the cover crop are primarily related to the sustainability of uh, environments because it really preserves the soil, improve the water quality, but at the same time, cover crop has the benefit of carbon. And so this is a work that we also got involved and in the, there's a review paper that we write. So I think to summarize, I think corn build has a, a less changed precipitation, but possibly we'll arrive in a very intense way, so we're gonna have a lot of extreme rainfall. Um, and temperature will continue increase and leading to much higher vapor pressure deficit that creates the atmospheric drought. Uh, I'm high, uh, this is from based on the literature, highly certain. The second part, I think if we don't have, uh, don't adopt any adaptation, we definitely experience crop yield loss in corn and less so in soybean. And, and then the third point that I want to make is the vapor pressure deficit and direct heat stress to harvest index are the two major mechanisms that leads to crop yield loss uh, uh, towards the climate change. And the excess of rainfall, important, too much, too little, both matters, um, and the effective adaptations is definitely required. Thank you. Thank you, Caillou. Um, maybe you could come back up, and I'd like to invite the other speakers to come up, and we'll have um, a panel session now, and so we can open it up to, to questions. Okay, thank you very much to uh, all of you. I have actually uh, two questions for Dr. Hertel um, based on the work you presented today. So the first one is actually related to the fact that um, you have very much focused on how um, those different uh, crops are being produced and traded around the world. But we all, of course, know that those crops are being used to feed cattle. They also are part of the uh, food agricultural industries and even other industries. So I'm thinking about um, asking you if you could elaborate a bit about those higher order effects that would be part of the uh, Leontief uh, inverse, for instance. And secondly, the other question I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on are related to the water content associated to those different crops. I'm guessing that their um, content of water per unit of production is a little bit different across those crops. And with global warming, places that are going to be somewhat um, experiencing a deficit of water may actually increase their competitive advantage by importing crops which are very water intensive. Um, so if you could eventually share your thoughts about those two points, I would appreciate. Thank you. Try that, is that good? Okay, thanks for those questions. Yeah, um, this framework we were using actually factors in that whole supply chain. So most of these products, as you've pointed out, especially the, the corn and the soybeans, are going not to human consumption directly, but through the, through the livestock and then into human consumption. So that is, um, this is what economists call a general equilibrium model. So it has all the sectors and all those interrelationships among sectors. So those are factored in here. Um, you're right, it would be interesting to go beyond um, this national welfare metric and think about how different 
food prices are affected or food security, even poverty, would be interesting dimensions to explore there. So it's in there, but it, we haven't teased it out yet. In fact, if someone asked me for the paper. Um, this is like <laughs> real time being produced, this research. So um, we're right, right in the thick of it and very open to suggestions about how to, how to improve it and, and make it more interesting. Um, on the, the water content, that's a very, very interesting that you asked this question. We have used the same framework, um, albeit um, in, in where we have disaggregated rain-fed and irrigated production at the level of um, agroecological um, agri zones and water and river basins. And we've looked at the question of scar water scarcity and trade, and this was actually joint with some folks at IFPRI, so Mark's team, some, some group there, um, actually projected potential future scarcity of water for irrigation. And we put this in this framework to ask how trade might, as you anticipated, mitigate this effect. And you'd, that paper's been published in Global Environmental Change. It's Lou et al. And it really does highlight the mitigating effect of trade in terms of future water scarcity. We weren't looking at climate change there, but trade clearly plays an important role um, when you think about it water scarcity tends to be very localized. Um, and while you can't trade the water, you can trade the commodity used to produce it. So um, we found quite a bit of mitigating potential there. Yeah. Um, more questions? We have a mic. Um, there's one in the back. And, and I'll ask one while, while um, Jenny's moving around. And, and this is a session on building resilience. And so um, this is kind of a question for everyone, but maybe, Don, I'll start with you. If you look at the $1 billion events that you talked about, which are increasing the most, and what do you think the steps are most um, pressing to take now for, for building resilience in regional climate um, change? This one. OK. So. There, there's a whole series of things that suggested in terms of um, how we can look at resilience. Um, but it really depends on what sector you're going to look at. So if, um, if some of the focus here has been on agriculture, and you know, I think we're still learning just what can be done, uh, we did find in some prior studies that the impacts on agriculture up to mid-century in our analyses really depend on which model you used, as the, you know, which climate model you look at, which, what agricultural model you use. And um, so there's still a lot of uncertainty there. But the uh, suggestions are all, from the analyses, are a lot like Caillou uh, showed, that we tend to get a, a decrease in, in yield. There's been a, some assumptions that we can counteract that with um, further genetic development, but that's, to me, certainly doesn't seem that clear a pathway. Um, but I think it does tell us we need to be more thoughtful about how we're dealing with uh, the whole agricultural process in light of the more severe precipitation, in light of warmer temperatures, in light of drought, and can we, can we think our way through this to um, to adapt better, but these guys are really the experts in this. So I'll, I'll turn it to them. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, resilience, right? Okay. Yeah. So I I mentioned in my talks that uh, about a few adaptations and uh, my my I can I can possibly show my personal favorites. Uh, I I think it uh, actually a good uh, believe for still gener genetic. Improvement possibly is 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 the the holy grail possibly, and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, potential traits can be improved. And uh, I know this campus is really focused on the the key part, you know, the photosynthesis and water use efficiency. And I think this is extremely critical. And I possibly expect to hear more from Don this uh, Don Art uh, this afternoon. Um, oh, maybe just the next. Session, yeah. So, uh, but a at the same time, I think management matters a lot. And uh, nowadays, we uh, I did not cover too much in my talk, but we actually live in an age that essentially we can see the daily image from the satellite for any like 10 meter resolution 
almost nowadays this become the, the, the truth. And if we see from the image how to really process this uh, image, you know, convert this image to the real information, to the real knowledge that we can start to use for decision making is still, uh, um, it's in it's in its infant uh, infancy, uh, you know, early stage, and um, and so I think uh, uh, from my point of view, I think this this also explain why the private industry has a lot of interest in in uh, the act business and the act technology business uh, because uh, you know this such big gap haven't been filled, and uh, possibly uh, we as scientists and engineers uh, has this. Uh, can possibly seize this opportunity because you know we we are not uh, we are basically at the same stage with the industry we 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 can possibly compete with them so the, the, these are my two favorite saw. Yeah, I think this resilience question is really important. Um, I actually wrote my talk without looking at the title of the session I was in <laughs> per se, but. Um, I do have some things to say about resilience that draw on economics, and um, I think it's particularly important. So this idea of sharing the burden of adjustment is particularly important when we're talking about these billion-dollar or multi-billion-dollar events that happen in one part of the world. Because if the burden is forced to be borne by just by people in that region, it can be very severe. Um, there was an excellent historical study done of the monsoon failures in India in the 19th century. And before uh, they built the railroads in colonial uh, India, um, the incidents of, of um, <coughs> um, malnourishment, of um, starvation was huge in the face of monsoon failures. Once they built the railroads in and you were able to move product in um, at those times, that's a form of trade. And that's a form of trade that can really and the evidence was that that really moderated those effects. We can think about the same in the global trading system today. Um, the idea that there might be a shortfall in the U.S., like in 2020, uh, 2012, the drought there, um, s a lot of the accommodation of that shortfall of production happened through our exports. Other people around the world adjusted. In order for that adjustment to occur, we need a trading system that functions in a smooth, economic way and isn't foiled by um, all kinds of other political agendas. I think we're at a critical point right now with regard to the tra global trading system. Do we keep riding this bicycle or do we let we fall off and reverse course? And I think from a climate change point of view, that having a, f uh, a fluid trading system is really important. The last point I want to make on this um, speaks, to, I know Illinois is very big in the bioenergy area and I want to underscore this point for that reason. You know, bioenergy, providing agriculture, linking agriculture to energy markets can be beneficial in the same way. But if we do it through mandates, it's a disaster. And we saw that in 2012. There was a lot of pressure to alleviate, to at least loosen the biofuel ethanol mandate that year. It wasn't done. As a result, prices increased much more than they needed to. There, everyone needs to share an adjustment when there's a billion dollar event. The economy helps do that. And um, these kinds of policies can get in the way of that if we're not careful. I want to add one more thing. Um, right now, the population is of uh, cities accounts for about 50 percent or a little over 50 percent of the total population in the world. By mid-century, we expect that to be up to over 70, roughly 70 percent. Um, so we really need to be thinking about the structure of cities and what that means in terms of sustainability, and that is something I'm actually trying to help get a new initiative here going for the for President Colleen, um, and we'll be talking, having lots of dialogues about that over over the uh, coming weeks and months. Um, I often also get asked, what can we do personally? And there's several quick answers. One is, first of all, your vote really makes a difference with elect people that really care about this issue and, and want to do something about it because it really is going to be a serious impact on, on our society. But secondly, we can be doing a lot in our own efficiency in our homes and our workplaces to um, save energy, save um, on our emissions of these greenhouse gases uh, that can also have a very significant effect and something really worth thinking about. And you put more money in your pocketbook.
Evan? Yeah, Tom, I really enjoyed your presentation. And as a biologist, I think I might have understood some of it. Um, and so these questions may be a little naive. It's kind of a two-part question. So the analysis is based on four crop species globally, and, and, and that countries have sort of dominant crop species. And so I was wondering, well, isn't there the potential to adapt by shifting? And wouldn't that change the analysis? And then I would just take it one step further and say, I'm assuming that these four crop species and the agricultural trade related to them is a fairly small part of the economies of the world countries that you showed. And so couldn't other aspects of their economic activity also step in and moderate the changes that you were projecting? Uh, that's, those are excellent points. Um, so first of all, we do, in the model, we do allow crops to shift around. So there is a decline in production in Brazil and an increase in uh, area and production in, in Canada as a result of the climate change. Um, uh, that's limited uh, based on kind of historical observation. Uh, but that is factored in, at least to some degree. Um, <coughs> these other, this other aspect I think is really important that you're talking about. And the, yeah. Yep. You can move around. Yeah. And that, that is allowed as well. They compete for land. So in fact, if soybeans hit harder you know, than corn, the corn expands to, um, to some degree. Now, of course, there could be improved representation of that. But that is, we've thought about that. We've built that in both movement within, um, across crops within the country. Um, in this particular analysis, we didn't do model the economic outcomes at the grid cell. They were modeled kind of at the national level. But um, and nonetheless, we capture some of that. Um, but this other question about moving out of agriculture, for example. Now, I mean, if these four crops are hit hard in Niger, um, probably anything else they can grow is going to be hit hard as well. But and um, uh, there are two choices we have. One is to extrapolate beyond what we know and just make some things up. We decided not to do that. But um, it, it does highlight the need to understand the impacts on these other crops. Um, but. Um, and in, um, in Illinois, it may not be hard. Uh, I mean, people already diversify. They work off farm half the time. They could just work overtime at the factory and drop their, you know, not farm so many acres. They could adjust that way. But if you're in Niger, all there is maybe for I is agriculture. Your options for moving out of agriculture are much more limited. You may end up trying to get on a boat to Europe or something. So. Um, it's, um, it depends on where you are, but the resilience um, is much greater in the parts of the world that are probably less threatened by ch climate change, and the resilience that you're alluding to is far less, maybe far less than we really incorporate in these models. I think we overestimate potential for adaptation in the tropics, in the, the poorest countries, in many of these models. This will adjust. They'll change varieties, whatever. They'll adapt. And I think the capacity is not there in many cases. And that really underscores, I think, we're under, likely underestimating the, the, the danger there. A question in the back? Two. Uh, I, I wonder, as we talk about resilience, we, why we are not emphasizing the role of government action and the role of policies. Uh, in particular with respect to the famines in India that you mentioned, the railroads actually played a role, but the, uh, by, they were by no means a sufficient condition for reducing the effects of famines. A far more accurate predictor of what happened to people as a result of famines was what government did. In the 1870s, there were two bouts of famines, one in Bihar. Tremendous uh, levels of action by the colonial government. They spent close to six million pounds sterling the loss of life was negligible at the end of the famine because of the operations the government undertook. More than 100,000 tons, tons of food imported from Burma and Southeast Asia remained unused. Two years later, similar intensity of famine, same administrator in charge of administering relief, 6.5 million people died because his expenditures of money in 1873 were seen as profligate and excessive. So he instituted what were called temple rations, which ensured that nobody, how close they might be to dying, 
would receive any food before they performed the required ration of work. A similar spare of famines in the 1890s demonstrated again what government action can do to enhance resilience and to ensure that people don't die, if that is one of the major objectives of our work to reduce the effects of climate change. In the first of those famines, the government did nothing and close to four million people died in India. In 1899, with a similarly or even more intense famine, barely anybody died. In 1942, Churchill moved ships of grain from Burma and Southeast Asia, Indonesia, to England to ensure that nobody would die, that there would be reserve grains. And in the 1942-43 famine, four million people died, a subject of major work by Amartya Sen. So I just feel like when we ignore what, uh, what are the contributors to resilience, we don't really have a very good grip on what would lead to it. Thank you. Yeah, I think you've said it all. Thanks for sharing that, uh, those further insights. I, um, my observation was just based on one, <laughs> one paper. You've uh, obviously studied this a lot, so thanks for sharing that. And it makes sense to me that um, government intervention seemed to make a big difference in that instance. It's complicated when it comes to food and government and stock holding and so on, uh, but you know, I think you made the point well. Thank you. One more question. Uh, hi, Tom. This uh, question's for you. So it, does your model incorporate the differences in sort of management regime? So in China, you have uh, lots of small farmer holdings, and you mentioned how in the Northeast they might be switching from corn to soy. Um, what about in terms of switching to large-scale mechanized agriculture as, as a government sort of incentive to be more adaptive? So, yeah, I think you would be disappointed if you delved into the um, agricultural modeling in China in this global model. Um, uh, we have some other efforts underway that are attempt to have more spatial resolution and more, uh, more nuance and more interaction with the, you know, the, 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 you know, the biophysical sciences. Um, in principle, there is a mechanism in there for intensification um, in places where that isn't the case. But of course, in China, overall, on average, very intensive agriculture already. Um, so this, this churning of farm sizes, the, the tendency, and we see it in the Midwest, of, of small farms be taken over by large farms and the commercialization, that, that does have a very important effect, has an important effect on resilience. Um, and, um, uh, but I haven't explored that here. But I, that I have a question. Can I ask one more question? Do we have time? Actually, that reminded me of a question I wanted to ask um, my co-presenter <laughs> here next to me. Um, and that is, um, you were talking about things we could do in breeding and so on that would increase resilience. But um, there's a paper published maybe three or four years ago in Science by David Lobel and co-authors who showed that actually the vulnerability of corn production in the U.S. to drought um, and has increased, not decreased, over the last 20 years. So what uh, basically there, you know, there's a figure there where average yields are going up, 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 and that basement that you hit in a really bad year is just staying right here. So the distance between the two is growing ever larger. We're less resilient. So it seems to me we can think of all these cool things to do but what the companies are delivering and what the farmers are wanting is to boost the mean yields and they're not enhancing resilience. Uh, it's a good question and I actually debating when I prepared the talk, I was debating whether I should put David's figure there. Um, and so uh, uh, make a perfect sense. So in other words that uh, in David's paper, uh, he discovered even the general trend of uh, increased yield, continued growth you know, because of better seed. But the, 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 the resilience of uh, deal with drought actually do not, uh, you know, doesn't show any uh, improvements over the years. And I think uh, I would break it into two points. Uh, so I think uh, one of the take home messages that I got from David's paper is, yes, that's true, but that also means the industry needs to start to think about uh, what really uh, controls that resilience part. 
and the intermediate ever variability part. And that that is related to other traits that people need to you know potentially worry about more. And I think the water use efficiency as well as some other features, for example, harvest index. I really think you know harvest index has been stabilized, but that's that we are talking about the potential. But we do see from the field level that uh, heat stress during the flower stage and the uh, green filling stage hits the harvest index and leads to huge variations from year to year, especially during the drought years. Um, and does that explain like about 30% of the year variability too? And so, um, uh, so you know, I, I think this just a message that uh, the breeding community also need to think about and how to improve that uh, drought resilience. Uh, another aspect uh, kind of relevant, I, I think the crop insurance aspect, because I start to work with some ag econ people in this university, I think the, the crop insurance uh, possibly provides some resilience, but the current system um, basically, government bail you out when you have a big, uh, you know, bad yield, and uh, how to make a better system, how to make farmers cast the incentive to automatically, you know, voluntarily adapt to the climate change is a big question. And I think, uh, uh, I, I believe Tom and the others can comment uh, and possibly have a better idea. But I think it, all these are connected. When we talk about the biophysical, people need to well, well, think about economics aspect and policy aspect. They're all connected at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. So we're going to take a coffee break now, um, but please, before we go, um, help me thank these speakers this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.